Greetings all and welcome to part two of our week two lecture. While the European colonial empires expanded, events moved rapidly throughout the rest of the world. In China, the Ming Dynasty that had ruled China since it had wrested control of China from the Mongol Yuan Dynasty in 1368 was facing internal dissension, rebellion, and decline. Reform efforts were initially successful, but a combination of factors derailed reform efforts. These included financial law changes in some of China's major trading partners that restricted the ability of Chinese businesses to access foreign hard currency. This led to a cascade of economic failures, an epidemic, and a wave of agriculture agricultural failures attributable to the Little Ice Age and a series of catastrophic floods. The combined stress of all these was too much, and the dynasty collapsed to be re replaced by the Qing dynasty in 1644. The Ming dynasty would be the last dynasty composed of Han Chinese to rule China. The Qing was derived from the ethnic Manchus from northern China, and was the last dynasty to rule imperial China. When the Qing dynasty was overthrown in 1912 and replaced by the Chinese Republic, it marked the end of more than 3,000 years of recorded Chinese imperial history. Northwest of China, the Grand Duchy of Moscow, one of the former subdivisions of the Mongol Empire, was expanding rapidly under the leadership of Ivan III. The duchy conquered the adjacent principalities of Novgorod and Lithuania and reunited the pieces of Kievan Rus, which had split into smaller states. Together, under the aggressive leadership of Ivan IV, also known as Ivan the Terrible, these formed the nucleus of an emergent Russian Empire, which would eventually expand to be the world's third largest empire behind only the British and Mongol empires. South of Russia and west of China, another unique imperial society was emerging on the Indian subcontinent, the Mughal Empire, which at its peak ruled most of India as well as a large part of Central Asia, was a unique mix of influences. Indigenous Indian culture was underpinned by Hinduism, mixed with Islam and Islamic culture from the West and the cultural leftovers of the Mongol conquest. Like the Songhe in Africa, the Muslim rulers of the Mughal Empire ruled over a majority non-Muslim population, but made it work through allowing a large degree of religious freedom. The Mughal Empire grew rapidly under the leadership of Akbar, the grandson of Babur, the founder of the empire. Akbar institutionalized a civil government and tax structure that respected the diversity of his empire, leading to a period of unprecedented growth and prosperity. Akbar's grand grandson Shah Jahan saw the empire reach its peak. Jahan is responsible for one of the most stunning pieces of architecture anywhere in the world, the fabulous Taj Mahal, a huge white marble mausoleum built for Jahan's wife. Taj Mahal remains as one of the finest examples of Islamic architecture anywhere in the world. The incredible expense of building it was later used as a pretense by one of Jahan's son, who sought the Mughal throne for himself, to block Jahan from reclaiming the imperial throne after a period of illness, and to have Jahan imprisoned, ostensibly for wasting the public treasury on a frivolous expense. In our last lecture, we saw how in Europe some popes, especially Alexander the Sixth, behaved in ways contrary to canonical law, inviting scandal and discredit upon the church. Alexander was certainly neither the first nor last pope to conduct himself this way, but he is probably the most infamous. Although whether this is due to Alexander's actual behavior or to post-mortem character assassination by his political enemies is debated by historians. Nonetheless, it is beyond question that the corruption of the church caused dissension and demands for reform. English cleric Thomas More, the author of Utopia, was the author of one of these, but the most eloquent and consequential demand for re re reform came from Martin Luther, a monk in the German town of Wittenberg. Deeply devout and outraged at the corruption of the church, Luther penned a demand for reform, his famous 95 Theses, and nailed it to the door of the church at Wittenberg. If Luther's demand for reform had been limited to just demands for reform, it may not have had the impact it had. Luther, however, also disputed several key points of church doctrine, 
He claimed that salvation was through faith and forgiveness, not works, that the Bible was the final authority on matters of theology, not the Pope or the Church, and finally, people did not need priests or the Church to interpret Scripture for them. These were fundamental challenges to church authority and relevance, and a challenge to them was something quite separate from demands for reform. Luther was summoned to defend himself against charges of heresy. Only his escape prevented his arrest and probable execution. He was then excommunicated by the Pope, but still refused to recant. It is important to remember that Luther was, was a reformer, not a radical. He sought the reform of the church, not its end. While Luther was away, other clerics had used his teachings to suggest that Luther would support an attack on the upper classes in general. Upon his clandestine return to Wittenberg, he was hor horrified to find the peasants in revolt. Luther condemned the rebels, and in the ensuing war, over a hundred thousand peasants were killed. Luther died in 1546, still under excommunication. The movement he inspired, however, remade the Christian religion by creating an entirely new doctrine and sect that embodied Luther's teachings about the role of the church and the faithful's personal relationship with the divine. Followers of Luther's teachings became known as Lutherans, and the larger ideology became known as Protestantism, which began spreading rapidly through northern Europe. The schism between Catholics and Protestants also spread to Britain, although under far different circumstances. In Britain, King Henry VIII had a personal problem and decided to use religious conflict to solve it. Henry's problem was simple. He wanted a son, and his wife had as yet not given birth to any boys. Henry, now also in love with Anne Boleyn, one of his wife's handmaidens, sought an annulment of his marriage from the Pope. The Pope, however, had other concerns. The Pope had long enjoyed a privileged relationship with the Holy Roman Emperor, with whom he had a basic reciprocal arrangement. The Emperor gave the Pope access to political authority, and the Pope gave the Emperor religious legitimacy. This cozy relationship, however, was threatened by Henry's desire for an annulment, as Henry's wife, Catherine of Aragon, was the Holy Roman Emperor's daughter and the Pope feared that granting Henry his request for an annulment would poison his relationship with Catherine's father, the Emperor. The refusal didn't stop Henry, however. Rather than accept the permanence of his marriage, Henry announced that he was pulling the entire nation out of the Catholic Church and creating a new church, the Church of England, with himself as the titular head. A newly appointed Archbishop granted Henry his divorce and approved his marriage to Anne, and England had become Protestant. There would be one attempt to bring England back into the church by Henry's eldest daughter, Mary I, also known as Bloody Mary for her executions of Protestant dissidents. After her death, her reestablishment of Catholicism was reversed by her sister, Queen Elizabeth I. The processes set in motion by the Reformation had not stopped on mainland Europe either. The Catholic Church made intense efforts to regain its preeminence, beginning with the Council of Trent that began in 1545. This was called the Counter-Reformation, and it was a broad range of effort that included pronouncements and documentation of church doctrine, the exiling of Protestant populations, heresy trials, the Inquisition, anti-corruption efforts, and the founding of new religious orders. Probably the foremost and most cons consequential of these orders was the Jesuits, founded by Ignatius Loyola in 1540 as a sort of elite force of soldiers for God, ready and willing to accept orders to serve and enforce church doctrine anywhere in the world in any conditions, a role the Society of Jesuits continues to play for the Catholic Church to this day. A protracted period of intensifying religious conflict followed. A series of treaties and agreements, such as the Peace of Augsburg, failed to stem the tide. A new Holy Roman Emperor, Ferdinand II, attempted to reimpose Catholicism. In response, Protestants formed the Protestant Union. Battle was joined in 1618, and the Thirty Years' War which followed was like nothing ever seen before. In the three decades of war that followed, more than eight million people were killed, making the Thirty Years' War one of the deadliest wars ever, the deadliest religious war ever, 
the deadliest war ever in Europe until World War I, and the deadliest war for civilians until World War II. Of the 8 million killed in the Thirty Years' War, about 780,000 were civilians, most of them peasants owing allegiance to the petty kingdoms of Germany, who had the bad luck to live on the battlefields, where they were caught between marauding armies living off the land, pillaging, plundering, spreading disease and death in their wake, and from both sides. The Thirty Years' War is significant for all of these, these reasons, as well as others. One of those, those other reasons was created by the Swedish king Gustavus Adolphus, who intervened to rescue the failing Protestant cause, and in the process created a revolution in military science and doctrine. Adolphus was an innovator of the First Order. Confronted with the question of how to make Sweden, a relatively small country, into a great military power, Adolphus innovated. He made his cannons much lighter and thus able to move and reposition on the battlefield, an advantage no other army had. Also, Adolphus had his engineers drastically improve the flint striking mechanism on his musketry, making his muskets far more reliable and less prone to breakage. He also introduced the practice of volley fire, allowing teams of musket soldiers to keep up a near continuous stream of fire at the enemy, and making his musket soldiers, called arquebusiers, far more effective than those of his enemies, at least for a while. These innovations allowed the Swedish armies to de decisively defeat far larger Catholic armies, staved off a Protestant defeat, and prolonged the war. Also, as one historian has noted, the army of Gustavus Adolphus was so unlike anything that had come before it that it was quite possibly the first army in 3,000 years that Alexander the Great would not have known how to command. Adolphus did not survive the war, and for all his innovation, the Swedish intervention accomplished little beyond prolonging the war until a settlement could be reached. His innovative tactics and doctrines, though, were immediately copied by every other army in the world, with all that implies. When the Thirty Years' War finally ended in 1648, the armies looked out on a land changed almost beyond recognition. Eight million people were dead. Two-thirds of the petty kingdoms of, of Germany, totally more than 1,300 principalities, were gone. It ended when it did, the way it did, really, because all sides were exhausted. The Peace of Westphalia, then, which ended the Thirty Years' War, was a peace of exhaustion, and the method that Westphalia used to settle the religious question, each ruler would be allowed to decide for their realm what the official religion would be, was almost elegant in its simplicity. However, Westphalia did nothing about the deeper political issue that had prolonged the war. The rivalry between the French royal family and the ruling Habsburg family in Austria and Spain, which was intense enough that Catholic France had subsidized Protestant armies in the north that were fighting the Austrian Habsburgs, France's religious ally and political opponent. Royal family rivalries between the ruling families of France, England, Spain, the Holy Roman Empire, and Russia would flare into war over and over until 1918, when they finally went too far. The empires learned another lesson from the Thirty Years' War, the danger of letting the imperial game get too far out of hand. The empires fought, subverted, undermined, and attacked each other in every way possible, but in the end, Nobody wanted anyone to lose so badly that they lost the ability to play the game. The goal of these wars was the domination of rivals, not the destruction of enemies. This led to an odd concept of limited war that dominated European battlefields for the next 150 years. Diplomatic relations were maintained, armies fought armies, cities were not sacked, and civilians were mostly left alone. No one wanted another catastrophe and no one wanted the game to end. This form of limited war had another benefit. It enabled, it enabled nations to fight almost continuously, for decades on end, without bankrupting themselves or exhausting their resources, which is exactly what happened. Most of the imperial powers had recovered from the exhaustion of 1648 by 1700. After a series of small wars, 
all the great powers engaged again in the War of the Spanish Succession in 1701, and remained almost continuously engaged afterwards until after Napoleon's final defeat in 1815. This has raised a debate among historians. Should these be considered discrete actions, one war after another, or would it be better to see this as a second hundred years war, a century plus of nearly continuous warfare over goals that largely remained consistent, like the earlier hundred years war that had straddled the 14th and 15th centuries. The War of the Spanish Succession, like the Thirty Years War, involved all of the great powers of the time and was fought on multinational battlefields as well as at sea. This tells us that there has been six world wars, not two. The Thirty Years War, the War of the Spanish Succession, the Seven Years War, the Napoleonic Wars, and World Wars I and II all fit that definition. So, when the Seven Years' War broke out in 1754, then developed into a general war in 1756, it was a contest between imperial powers capable of, inv- of engaging on a global battlefield. Most of the wars of the previous century had not had a decisive victor. Someone won a battle, a few colonies or trade routes got shuffled around, and the next round of the game began. This time, though, it would be different. Although, afterwards, it is possible that the victors might have wished they had not won quite so big for reasons that will become apparent. The Seven Years' War began in North America as a conflict between French colonists moving into the Ohio Valley from the Mississippi, fighting alongside Native American allies, and English colonists wishing to expand westward into that same Ohio Valley area. This is why the conflict is known in American history as the French and Indian War. More accurately, though, the French and Indian War is merely the North American theater of a global battle for imperial dominance that was part of a larger war that had been going on for 65 years and would go on for another 60. What made the Seven Years' War different was the differing strategic visions and how they were implemented. British policy toward Europe for centuries had been more or less unchanged, to ally with the second strongest power on the continent in order to prevent any single power from dominating the continent. There was also a new player in the game this time, a thoroughly militarized land power, Prussia. France, as the strongest land power, could expect to lose overseas colonies to the dominant British Navy, but would take enough territory from Britain's allies on the continent to be able to trade for the return of their lost colonies, a return to pre-war status quo. Britain, on the other hand, had an altogether different idea, ally with Prussia and subsidize them to hold the French armies to minimal gains and then use the British Navy to take the entire overseas French Empire. And that is largely how it worked out. When the Seven Years' War ended in 1763, France had been effectively expelled from the North American continent, had lost most of its valuable sugar colonies in the Caribbean, and had lost colonies in Africa, India, and the Far East. In the attempt to preserve its victory, Britain had attempted to be gracious in victory and and had returned most of the Caribbean colonies, as well as the Indian and Asian colonies it had taken from France but the French memory of their humiliation would endure, and French desire for revenge would drive France to go to war in North America again, this time decisively intervening in the American Revolution, ensuring an American victory and thus independence, and costing Britain all of its mainland American colonies south of Canada. This is why it is possible to argue, after the fact, that it may have been better for Britain if Britain had not won such a huge victory in the Seven Years' War. The costs incurred had doubled Britain's national debt, leading them to levy direct taxes on the American colonies and helping trigger the revolution that would see the birth of the United States. And for France, the costs incurred had been devastating and had helped trigger the French Revolution, which ended an imperial history of France that dated back to Charlemagne. This lecture will be continued in Part 3.